Welcome everyone to class. Thank you, um, online students, for joining us, and in-person students. Welcome to our e-learning students who will also be listening uh, to this lecture. Thank you, Nikhil, for joining us. Heard you're not well, but we were able to do the setup and manage. Thank God for uh, Saint Pastor Francis. <laughs> who helped us <laughs> to do the setup. Okay, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask, uh, where's the mic? Where's the mic? Give it to Chira, let him pray. Chira, can you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the day, Lord, as we are here to learn from your Lord, my Father, God. Give us more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from your word so that, Lord, we learn and we'll equip in our life, my Father, and we'll live in your word, my Father, God. We thank you for the faculties. We thank you for everything. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So we began studying Romans chapter 1, and we came right up to verse 5. So can one of you again read verse 5, please, quickly? Anyone? Romans 1, chapter 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Yes. So Paul is saying here that through Christ, what have we received? Grace and apostleship. Okay. So just a side note we looked at about what is grace and apostleship. We said apostleship has to do with commissioning. Okay. Or it's the work, the mission that God has given to us. And what is grace? Enabling, divine empowering that empowers us, enables us to fulfill the commission, the call, the purpose, the mission that God has over our lives. Okay. So if you look, Paul, you know, uses this in a very common way. He always mentions this. And when he talks about his ministry. And he says that through Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. So what is the commission given here for? In this context, what is the commission given here? Or what is the commission we are given here? In verse 5, what is the commission we have been given? Verse 5, what does it say? What is the commission we have been given? Huh? Obedience to the faith. We have been given the commission to bring people in obedience to the faith in Jesus Christ in all the world. So in all the world, we have been commissioned to bring pe people to obedience to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. So the work we are doing, the commission that we have, the mission that we have here is we have it from God, and we have this to bring people to obedience to the faith, and we have also been given the grace of God. So when God calls you to do anything in his kingdom, don't be afraid. Why shouldn't you be afraid? It is from God, okay? He, is, he will give you the grace, he will give you the skills, he will give you the favor, he will give you the divine enabling and the empowering to fulfill what he has for you. Okay. So the work that he is mentioned here is to bring people to the obedience to faith in all the world. Okay. Now, Paul uses this phrase in obedience to the faith in other places as well. He uses this phrase in Romans chapter 15 verse 18, where he talks about making the Gentiles obedient to the faith through signs, miracles, and wonders. And also he talks about this in Romans chapter 16, verse 26, where he refers here to people coming to the obedience to the faith. Okay. So coming to the faith is coming to a place of Coming to the faith is coming to a place of, according to this verse, coming to the faith is coming to a place of obedience. Yes, 
Okay. Now, obedience is not uh, to the faith is not emphasized when we just merely tell people, "Hey, come to the faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved." Okay. Or it's not just telling people, "Hey, come to the faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be blessed." Or it's not telling people, "Hey, come to the faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be healed." Or it's even not telling people, "Hey, come to the faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be free." But what is Paul saying? He's looking at coming to the faith as coming to a place of obedience, as a place of surrender, as a place of submission. Okay. So when we come to a place of obe uh, obedience to faith, we are actually giving up our own freedom to obeying Christ. We are saying no to our will, our plans, our purposes, our agendas. We are saying yes to God's plan, His purposes, His agenda. We are coming to, uh, you know, to obeying Christ and giving up our own freedom. And this is something that we need to make clear when we are preaching the gospel. Okay, because many times when people come to the faith in Jesus Christ, they're only you know, coming to, uh, uh, you know, one aspect of it. What is that one aspect? That one aspect is they only believe Jesus as their savior, right? Hey, my sins are forgiven. I have a place in heaven. Eternal life is assured for me. But they don't come to a place of making Jesus Christ as Lord. Salvation is coming to a place where we're making Jesus Christ both as Lord and as savior. Savior is easier than making him Lord. Why? Why is it difficult to make him Lord? Yes, your uh, uh, Lord means you're giving him total control over an entire life, every area of your Life, you're giving him total submission, total control, which is very difficult for people to do. Okay, so that is this is what we need to preach when we are preaching the good news of the gospel. This is an important aspect. Hey, you have to come to the obedience of the faith. That means you have to make Jesus Christ as Lord, totally surrendering, totally submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you come to that place of total submission and surrender, all of the others automatically follow, right? Healing follows. There's, um, you know, um, there's freedom, there's peace, there's blessing, there's forgiveness. Everything comes as a result of obedience of your faith to Jesus Christ. Are able to understand? Yes? Yes, no? Okay. So we'll move on to verses 6 and 7. So can somebody else please read? Verses 6 and 7, please. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Okay, called to be saints. Continue. Grace to, oh, sorry. Hmm. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So in verses 1 to, um, uh, you know, verse 6, okay, verse 6, it says, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, believers, God has given us this call. God has given us this commission to preach the good news among all the nations. And you are also part of that call. Each one of us a part of that call. Each one of us are called by Jesus Christ. And you have been brought to that place of obedience to the faith. Okay. So in verses 1 to 6, we basically see who Paul is. We saw Paul is a born servant of Jesus Christ, was called, was separated, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We see what he's proclaiming. We saw that he's proclaiming a message that was proclaimed by the prophets in the Old Testament, which is the Holy Scriptures. And it's a message about Jesus Christ, who was declared to be the Son of God by power and by the resurrection. And also we see in verses 1 to 6, Paul is saying that he's doing this by the grace 
and the commission that God has given him. Okay. And what is his objective? His objective is so that people can be brought to the obedience to the faith. Okay. His objective is that people from all nations will be brought to the obedience to the faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. And verse 7, Paul goes on to mention why he is writing this letter to the Romans. Okay. So he says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting to see how Paul in his letters, how he sees, how he looks and how he calls the people of God. Okay, it's very interesting. So if we ask some of you, what is the view of the believers in the church? Or what is your view of saints or the people of God in the church? What will be your answer? How do you see people of God? Come on, how do you see people of God? Okay, you see them as chosen by God, okay? Sometimes you see them as believers, but far from being believers, right? They're saying, hey, they've come to church. See how they've come. See how they're dressed. See how they're behaving. See what they're doing, right? Or we have such negativity. But look at how, you know, Paul is looking at the people of God. What is he calling them? Yes, beloved of God, called to be saints. So Paul is saying, you know, as beloved of God, he's saying, hey, as beloved of God, you are deeply loved by God, which means when you're God, hey, you are called as the holy ones of God, saints of God, somebody who set the path, holy. Okay, so that is the way Paul is looking at the church, or that is how he's looking at the saints, that is how he's looking at the people of God, right? Now, some of us who serve in church or minister in church, how do we perceive believers in the church? Or how do we speak of them? You know, sometimes we speak with their, of them with such negativity, right? With such hopeless thoughts, with such discouraging thoughts, negativity always. But we can learn from Paul how he chooses to see the people of God, that they are beloved of God, they're those who are loved by God, special to God, and also those who are called to be holy, right? Okay. So when God himself looks at people as his beloved, as his loved, as his chosen, how much more we need to look at people in that same eyes, in that same perspective perspective with gracious eyes just like God looks at us with gracious eyes and then he says grace uh, grace to you and peace from God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ so he's basically giving them some you know well-wishing thoughts um, or just you know just some good words nice words well-wishing thoughts that he is presenting here or, or he's telling them okay we'll move on to verse 8 can somebody read verse 8 please Romans chapter 8, 1 verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all, you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Yes. So here we see that Paul goes on to talk how he prays for the believers. First, he's saying what he thinks about them. Then now he's talking about how he's praying for them. Okay. First, he offers prayers of Thanksgiving, right? Thankful prayers. He's thankful for what? Okay. He's thankful for the, all the believers for what aspect of? Their faith. their faith, yes. Why is he mentioning about their faith? Okay. People are speaking about the, the believers at Rome, people were speaking greatly about their faith why were people speaking greatly about the people the, the church's faith at rome because the church at rome was going through severe persecution remember i told you in the introduction 
uh, Nero had told all the people to leave Rome, the Jewish believers to leave Rome, and hence we see that um, um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, yes, I was going to say Ananias and Sapphira. Aquila and Priscilla, they come to Corinth and there they meet Paul and they speak about the believers and the church at Rome. Okay, so Paul is saying, Hey, I've heard greatly about your faith, even in the midst of the persecution the difficulties and the hardships that you're going through, your faith is so strong. You have not given up on your faith. And he's saying, I'm thanking God for the faith that you all are exhibiting. Okay. So something that we can learn here from Paul is that we can find some things, you know, uh, to thank God for the people who serve and minister to, in the church or we can also find some things that we can thank God for, for the people that we are ministering to, or the people that we are engaging in ministry, or the people that we are serving, and we can thank God for them. Okay, so let's look at what else Paul thanks God for in verse 9. Can somebody read verse 9, please? For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, of his Son, that witness seizing. I may mention of you always in my prayers. So saying, I'm praying for you, and my prayer is without? What is the meaning of without ceasing? Uh, Non-stop, okay, just praying. And he's saying, the, the church, and he's saying here, who is his witness? God. Yes, the go God is my witness. Why is he saying that God is my witness, that I'm praying for you? Why does he have to go in such detail to say, hey, you know, God is my witness that I'm praying for you. Why? Any idea? He's trying to convey that deep uh, love for the church and the people. Okay, he's trying to convey his deep love and affection for the church and the believers at Rome, okay? Now, actually, the believers at Rome could have thought, hey, who is this Paul? He doesn't even know us, right? He's never even visited us. He's not even taught us. We are not his children. Then why should he pray for us, right? But Paul is trying to say here, hey, you know, I, I even have, if I've not met you, I've never come to Rome. I've not established the church there. But, you know, yet I am praying for you and God is my witness, Okay. And I want to point out uh, something very important in verse 9 is the phrase. What do you think is the important phrase in verse 9? Whom I serve with my spirit. Okay. Now, when we serve God, we think serving God is physical work. Yes or no? Huh? We think it's physical work, and it is physical work, yes. We think, you know, I have to dress a certain way, right? I have to do this. I have to preach like this. Or I have to, you know, uh, bring about all of these things. So if you're preaching or teaching or, you know, uh, ministering in church, then you say, hey, I have to dress like this, I have to behave like this. Even if uh, somebody gets angry with me, I'm in the ushering team or, if, uh, you know, I'm in the... Um, Welcome team. If I say, please, you know, this this place is for uh, mothers with children. Please go up in the front. They say, no, can I please sit here? And, you know, I get angry and mad, but I have to just smile at them and be nice with them. So there's, you know, we think it's more physical work. It's a certain way I dress, certain things I do. I have to preach like this. Well, all those things are, yes, is important. But here Paul is saying that we serve God in our spirit. Very interesting, right? I'm not just serving God with my body. First, I am serving God with my spirit. Okay? So the question that we need to ask is, what is the condition of our spirit man? Even as we are serving God, we need to ask ourselves this question and always repeatedly ask ourselves this question, what is the condition of my spirit? Because serving God is the work of the spirit. Ministry work is spiritual 
work. Why do we say it's spiritual work? God is spirit, right? And we are serving God in our spirit, right? And also, why do we say it's a, a spiritual work? Which aspect of the kingdom or dimension of the kingdom of God we are living in? The spiritual dimension, the spiritual aspect, okay? So, it's important for us, you know, to look at our spirit man, to look at the condition of our spirit man and ask ourselves, hey, is my spirit man in good shape? Am I feeding my spirit man with the things of God? In my spirit, is my spirit intimate with God? Is it engaging with God? Am I hearing from God? Am I strong in my spirit man? Sometimes it's sad to see that many of them have done great ministry, but they have, you know, gone away from God. They've fallen. You know, why? Because they have got so used to being busy bodies like Martha in the kingdom of God, rather than being like Mary, just engaging, being intimate with God. So it's always important for us to check and ask ourselves, hey, how is the condition of my spirit, man? Okay? We can always gauge our physical man by the things that we're doing. Hey, I'm tired. I no longer can do this ministry. I think there's too much of work. It's too cluttered. I need to do this, this, this. But we always overlook our spirit, man. But here, what does Paul say? You know, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Very, very important. Okay. So, um, Paul is saying that part of his spiritual work that he is doing is for, is to pray for those that he wants to go and meet, those he wants to minister to, those he wants to serve, and those he wants to impart into their lives. Okay. Look at verse 10. Can somebody read verse 10, please? Romans 1, 10. Making request, request if, by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Yes. Amen. So in the KJV, it says, Making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So what is Paul's desire? To go to and meet the believers at the Church of Rome. And what is his desire also? Like I read in the KJV, uh, had to have a prosperous journey. What's the meaning of prosperous journey? A successful journey, a journey that is good, well, you know, thriving, you know. Uh, journey and he says by the will of God to come to you okay so part of what he's praying is he's saying hey I'm praying that I want to come and meet all of you and I want to serve you but does uh, Paul have a prosperous journey when he goes to Rome yes no no we see that Paul was accused you know uh, by the Jews in Jerusalem Acts chapter 22 and then he was you know apprehended by the romans and paul appeals to caesar and they send him to caesar okay so he's taken where does he go to meet caesar rome right and how how many people escort paul there's 200 roman soldiers 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen Okay, we read this in Acts chapter 23, verse 23. So Paul was led like a prisoner, like as to say he was a, some real great criminal. No, he was led like a prisoner. And for two years, he was in Caesarea. And from there, Paul appealed to Caesar. And so Paul was sent to Rome. And the journey that he had to Rome, was it pleasant? No, it was a very, very rough and difficult journey. They were stranded in the sea for 14 days. You know, they were shipwrecked and then they landed at Malta. Okay. And then we know that Paul gets bit by a viper, but a uh, snake, but nothing happens to him. 
And then we see that, you know, three more months of sailing and then he finally arrives in Rome. But the believers from Rome, they came and met Paul even before he actually reached Rome. So maybe Aquila and Priscilla and others who have engaged with Paul, who have gone to Rome, have spoken greatly about Paul. So they're very excited and they all came to meet Paul even before he reached Rome. But when Paul goes to Rome, how does he go? In what condition is he in? Is he a free man? Is he a free man? No, he's a prisoner, right? He's still as a prisoner. But the wonderful thing that he's under house arrest. That means being under house arrest means that he has the freedom to meet people. People can come and go and meet him and bring things and all of those things. So Paul spent two full years in house arrest and he freely ministered to everyone who came to him and the believers were blessed and the church was strengthened. So it was about three years after Paul is writing this letter that he actually gets to go to Rome. But when he gets to go to Rome, he has such a difficult journey and he goes to Rome not as a free man, but he goes as a prisoner, but he's able to spend two full years at Rome and impart into the life of the church at Rome. Okay, so what can we learn from this, this episode in Paul's life? What do we learn? What can we learn? Come on, what can we learn? Can you lose the mic, please? His, um, he prayed for like a prosperous journey, but what has happened is it was very difficult, but end of the Time, the Lord's uh, will was fulfilled there. He spent a lot of time in. Yes, yes. So even though he desired to go to Rome, he eventually went to Rome, but it was not an easy journey. It was a difficult journey. But yet he was able to do what he had planned and what God's will was to uh, impart, equip, and edify the church at Rome. So sometimes ministry journey, not sometimes, you know, most of the time ministry journey is not very easy it's very difficult right and i think we need to when we're saying yes to ministry we're saying yes to all the hardships all the difficulties all the long hours of toil and labor and hard work and everything but in the end result it is fulfilling okay why why is it fulfilling because the work of the lord is being done his kingdom is being extended through you Okay, you're fulfilling the will of God. And that is success. That is prosperity. Yes, it's hard work. Yes, it involves night and day. It requires a lot of giving up of things and all of those things. But it is prosperity. It is successful. When I say prosperity and successful, I'm not talking about in the worldly terms. What I'm saying is ultimately we're fulfilling the will of God. So success is not determined by how comfortable things have been, how easy the journey has been. By comfort, we are meaning how we have fulfilled the purpose for which God has called us to. And we see this in the life of the Apostle Paul and many other apostles, right? They went through such hardships and difficulties in the way they were martyred and killed, right? But their life was very, very fulfilling. And we still speak of their lives. We still learn from their lives. Okay, so ministry or believer's life, the journey can be hard, difficult, but yet it can be prosperous and successful because we can fulfill the calling, the purpose that God has on our lives. Amen. Okay, we'll move on. Any questions so far? Anything that needs more clarity? Anything that you want to ask? Okay, if not, we'll move to verses 11 and 12. So can somebody please read verses 11 and 12, please? Verses 11 and 12. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the, by the mutual faith, both of, both of you and me. Okay. So here, the church at Rome was not a baby church, right? That means it was not a church that had just begun or started. 
uh, we know that some of the believers from the time of Pentecost, that is AD 30 to 57, almost 27 years, you know, before Paul comes there, you know, they where the church was established. And Paul was saying that I want to come and give you some spiritual gift. Okay. So spiritual gifts can be imparted, can be given, and can people can also be trained in the spiritual gifts. Okay. So spiritual gifts can be imparted uh, and spiritual gifts can also be trained. Okay. So some things can be taught. Some things just need to be caught. Okay. Some things can be taught. Some things need to be taught. So impartation can pl take place in different ways. It can take place when you're sharing or when you're teaching about those gifts. Now, the word impart comes from the Greek word metadidomi, which means to give a share of, okay, or to impart. The word meta means with and didomi means give. And uh, this is, you know, the same word that is used elsewhere uh, when Paul writes to the uh, uh, the church at Ephesus in um, Ephesians 4.28, even here in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, and in Luke chapter 3, verse 11. And in Luke chapter 3, verse 11, it's basically saying, you know, when two pe when a man has two coats, let him give one to an other who has none. So spiritual gifts can be imparted when you associate with the person who has a spiritual gift. So as we relate or when we associate or when we fellowship with each other, the gift can be passed on from one person to the other. And so Paul is saying that he's longing to see them. Why is he longing to see them? So that he can impart to them some spiritual gifts, so that he can encourage them. And also he wants to be encouraged himself. So here we see the humility of Paul, right? He's not saying, hey, only I can give to you. I Only I can impart, only I can teach. He's saying, I can also learn from you. Okay, you can also encourage me. So as ministers of God, you know, we need to know what we carry. What is the grace upon our life? The grace upon our life matches what? The grace in your life matches your? Yes. Or in other words, your grace in your life matches your? Your gifting, your calling, your function, whatever calling, function, gifting you have, your, the, the grace is uh, released towards that. So that enables you to fulfill that calling and that function. Okay. So as ministers of God, we need to know what we have, what God has given to us. So what God has given to us? What has God given to us? He's given us what? In this context, what we're saying. He's given you? Spiritual. spiritual gifts, okay. And he's given you grace to accomplish the spiritual gifts. And also he's given you, yes, faith, the truth in his word, okay. So you're carrying all of this. You're carrying the faith. You're carrying the truth of God's word. You're carrying the truth of who God is, revelation of who God is. And you're also carrying the grace of God over your life. That's enabling you to fulfill the various things that he has called you to do. Okay. So even as you carry all of these things, you know, you should make it your desire to say, God, I want to impart this to others as well, I want to give in to the lives of others as well. So as all of you are in the third year, you know, you have certain grace, gifts, functions that God has called you to. You have spent two years of your life studying here. You have the knowledge of the truth of God that has been sowed into your lives, that has been imparted to you. So you can say, God, I want to give that or you have experience, you've learned from your experience, I want to give that to the first year students who have come into college. Some of them new away from home, but I want to impart into their lives. So how can I give? So it should be a desire to give. When you have a desire to give, God leads you to the right person and how you can minister to them. Okay. So even as some of you are in, you know, just um, 
ministering in church or you know just um, helping out in the local church or you have your own ministries or you know whatever it is you know you carry certain grace upon your life you are also part of the bible college you're also learning so you can also impart and give into other people's life amen Okay. So Paul is intentional about this and he's saying, hey, I ca I'm carrying something. I know what I want to impart. I know what I want to give. Okay. So also we need to know that impartation should be something that is intentional. We need to be intentional about giving into other people's life. Okay. Which means there is a Christian input we can give. We can continue to give to those who have been believers newborn believers uh, believers for a few years or even those who have been believers for a long time you can still give into their lives you can still sow into their lives you can still speak into their lives and you can make their lives strong secure and established in the faith okay some of you ladies here you know you can go back and impart into your husband's life into your children's life you know uh, into your uh, family lives your your parents your you know, whoever your, your, your siblings, you can minister to them as well. And you can make them strong, secure, and established in the faith. Amen? Any questions? Okay, if not, we'll continue with verses 13 to 15. So can somebody please read verses 13 to 15, please? Now, I do not want you to be unaware. Brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindrance until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Gentile and Greek and barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So I am, so as much as I in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Amen. So this is the second time Paul is making known to the church that it is his great desire that he wants to come and see them. Okay. So even in our ministry, we have desires, right? I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to serve God like this. I want to do that for God and his kingdom. You know, so also Paul is mentioning about his desire that he wants to go and see them and meet them and when god uh, when sorry when apostle paul you know uh, shares his desire is he doing it out of his own will out of his own plan and purposes what do you think most of the times no look at what he says in second corinthians chapter 1 verse 17 can somebody read that please second corinthians chapter 1 verse 17 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? So here Paul is saying, hey, do I, when I do plan, do I plan things lightly? No. The answer is no. You know, and he says, when I plan according to the flesh, uh, when I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? The answer is no. So he plans not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit, right? He's depending on the leading of the Holy Spirit. So also when we are in ministry or in our daily lives or everyday lives or wherever God has placed you or planted you, it's important to depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit, okay? The, the verse in the Bible that says, many are the plans and purposes of the man's heart, but it's the Lord's plans that prevails okay so yes we will have our own plans agendas to do certain things but we need to always take it up to god and ask him and depend on the holy spirit for his leading okay so we too must plan according to spirit where to go who to go where to whom to meet who to engage in our ministry who to take in our teams what god wants us to do next what are some of the programs ideas creativities that he wants us to do Okay, and he says here in verse 14, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to wise and to the unwise. 
So he's saying, when he's saying, I'm a debtor means what? When you're a debtor means what? Yeah, you owe something to somebody, okay? So when I owe something to somebody, it means that I'm a debtor. So what is Paul meaning here to say? I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. I, to, I have to preach to both, yes, to Greeks and to the barbarians. Why is supposed to preach to the Greeks? Another word for Greeks is Gentiles, yes. Why? The gospel is for everybody, okay. But why is Paul saying I am a debtor? Means I owe something. I'm called. Yes, he's called as an apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, Paul was a Jew, but the Lord made him an apostle to the Gentiles. How do we know this? Galatians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Okay, so we learn from here that God appoints different people for different ministries. Yes or no? Yes. Some of us want to do some things, but God calls us to do something else. I know in my own life, you know, I was interested in doing counseling. So when I was in my third year, in my third year, we have to do six months of um, uh, six months of internship. So if a church is sponsoring you, then the church can ask you to come back and you serve with your church. But if you have not sponsored by your church, you're free. You're free to choose wherever you want to go. So I'd gone to Kolkata and I was uh, the counseling drug addicts and alcoholics. I was very interested. And in our fourth year, we write a thesis. Okay. So it's like solid work that we do. So I wrote my thesis even on counseling drug addicts and alcoholics because I was interested in that. But all the time, God had different plans for me. His plans for me was to minister to children. So I found myself that, you know, even when I went to Bible college, we had weekend ministry. So every weekend we were posted to a specific church in that whole year. So we have to go to that church and minister. So obviously, because I'm a, you know, young lady or girl, you know, I was put in Sunday school. You know, invariably we are put into Sunday school. But I realized that even on campus, when we had, you know, campus um, ministry, um, they had put me to send me to schools. You know? So I had to go one of the days in the week, uh, in the afternoon, go to schools and teach scripture. And um, on Friday evenings, we had, you know, all of our um, faculty, staff, uh, married students, but all staying with their children and with their spouse on the campus. Okay, so we had a campus uh, Sunday school for all our campus children. Even there, I was ministry. But I, I never knew what, I didn't know that my calling was for children's ministry. So even when I went to Kolkata and I was ministering among drug addicts and alcoholics, I stayed from stayed with children that I picked up from Haura platform. So I was ministering to them. I was also ministering to um, uh, the, this rag picker children who would come and we minister to them. And all they, this, uh, this ministry which I was ministering with, they had a school, so I was also teaching there. So I was, I was planning counseling. God was constantly planning children's ministry, and he was opening doors for me. But eventually when I wanted to go back to Kolkata and start a, a women's addiction wing, because there were no homes for women addicts who would come from different places, you know, uh, my boss looked at me and said, Selena, I think you're looking very tired. Why don't you just go back home, rest, and then come back? I was so excited. I went straight from Bible college itself there. So I went back home, and there was no turning back because God took me to children's ministry. Of course, I started working with, uh, you know, Youth for Christ, and then I was um, helping a professor write um, books on Old Testament characters, which OM publishes. And also, I was... Uh, you know, joined a ministry where they were doing family. It was basically family. And one day my boss turns to me and says, hey, you're very good with children. Why don't you just start children's ministry? So I started, um, uh, you know, a children's ministry where we were basically going to schools and teaching a scripture and life skills and writing the curriculum and all of that we did. So and what I'm saying is, you know, we can have our own agendas, plans, hey, I want to do this, I want to serve these kind of people, I want to go here and serve, but it's God's will and plan that ultimately 
prevails. He knows what he has wired us, designed us, crafted us to be, where we'll be best suited. So when I look at my own life now, when I look back, when I find myself finding some of the things in ministry difficult to do, I realize why God has put me in children's ministry. Because I know that I'm not crafted or not wired or not created for this particular aspect of ministry. Okay, So God knows best and we need to just give in to God and do what he's asking us. And that is when the grace um, is given to us more. Okay? Yes. Ma'am, my question is like, um, there is a ministry for one person. So if that person, he didn't went for that ministry, he chose another one ministry. Is there any wrong in that? Or God will bring back to that ministry? Or what is, there? is there anything wrong in that? Um, there's nothing wrong in that because you're doing ministry. But the, the only thing is that you will not be as fruitful as you have to be in the place where God has chosen you to be. So like I'm saying now, you know, I do a lot of other ministries apart from children's ministry. Okay, I actually now do very less of children's ministry, do more of that. So when I see myself doing other ministries, I'm beginning to think, hey, I'm finding it so difficult to do this. It's it's not part of me. It, it, and because it's not coming spontaneously from me, it becomes more strenuous, it becomes more difficult, it becomes more challenging. It's not something that I'm enjoying. And then I realize, hey, that is why God has called me to children's ministry, because He's not. he knows that this is not my skill, this is not my ability, this is not where I'm talented in. And that is why I have to put how much more effort, right? But you give me anything with children, it comes so spontaneous. And I've seen that when I was in, in children's ministry, we were never thought about children's ministry when we were in Bible college. Everything that I've done of children's ministry, everything was just so, was a heavily download. Not Google download, but just heavily download. Everything just came from God. So when God calls you for the specific things, he skills you, gives you the any capabilities, he enables you, gives you the grace, the favor. He brings people and he gets you to just flourish and glow and be prosperous and you begin to enjoy it. But if you're in a place where you want to be, you can still serve God. God can still use you, but you will not be as fruitful and you will not find it so fulfilling, so enriching. It will be a struggle and a challenge then when God wants you to be. Yeah. Good question. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay, so we'll move on. So the major part of Paul's calling was among the Gentiles. Okay, they were Greeks. Now the Greeks were highly intellectual people. Okay, they were people who would think and reason. And also Paul says, I'm indebted to the barbarians. Who are the barbarians? People who are not highly educated. Now, why does Paul say he's he's a debtor? Why does Paul say he's a debtor? Why does Paul owe both to the Greeks and to the barbarians? Why does he say I'm a debtor? Because Paul is made as an, his calling is an apostle. Yes, his calling is an apostle. Or he had a calling to preach to the Greeks or the Gentiles and the barbarians and the he's saying the call of god over my life has made me indebted to them okay has made me that i have i owe them something why because god is appointed me okay so when god appoints you you are indebted you are you know um you are a debtor okay god has appointed you you have to go you have to fulfill the call that god has placed on your life the plan and the purpose he has, and you have to serve him, okay? The only way you can pay the debt, so to speak, is going to the people, going to the place, going to the ministry where God has portioned or called you to be. And that is where he will enable us, okay? So hence, Paul is saying, I owe this to the people at Rome because he says he's ready to come to them and preach the gospel to them. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll uh, begin with verse 15, the next class. Anyone has any questions, doubts? Any questions, any doubts?
Okay, if there are no questions, no doubts, so we'll stop here. Okay, thank you all for um, joining class, and I'll see you next um, Tuesday.